Let us pray. Almighty God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. As we walk this wilderness journey of Lent, light the way in the darkness that through your word we might know that you are with us on this journey comforting and strengthening, encouraging and challenging us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Good morning. The Old Testament reading comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, which can be found on page 160 of your pew Bible. The bronze snake. He traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought, out, brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many, many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Praise that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who has bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake, they looked at the bronze snake and lived. The New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, which can be found on your pew Bible on page 1081. Jesus teaches Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you do if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my, at my sayings. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. How do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then? Will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snakes in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray.
Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know how early back in your life you can remember. Um, for me, I have a few snapshots of uh, my little, little young ages, but one in particular jumps out in my mind this morning. I was a kindergartner, uh, so eh, five years old or so, and a uh, kindergartner in Mrs. Brown's class. And uh, Mrs. Brown was a uh, lovely, jolly woman uh, who was very kind and, uh, and very loving. And I trusted her until one day she brought for show and tell a uh, garden snake, common garden snake. And, oh, they don't bite, she said. They do. <laughs> and it bit me right on the index finger. I remember the fear was worse than the pain. Although I do remember it feeling like being poked with a whole bunch of toothpicks all at once. But it scared me to death. And of course, as a kindergartner, what do you think I did? Yeah. I screamed and cried. So I have to admit, when I read this text this morning from Numbers, one that quite frankly doesn't get read very often in church because it's, well, kind of out there, I have to admit when I read and was reminded that it was the Lord himself who sent the, the poisonous serpents, my thought was, had I been there, I would have said, check please. I'm going back to Egypt, thank you very much. So the Israelites are complaining again that God has brought them out into the wilderness to die. Is it any surprise God sent poisonous serpents? Again and again and again they complain. Now, this is one of those texts that, quite frankly, you can read too much into. Is it every time you complain that God is going to send serpents to you to bite you? Thank you. That's not true. But there's something larger happening here. A foreshadowing of something yet to come. God is giving his people a language and a story and images for us to truly understand what's coming. So think of it for just a moment. If you are a Hebrew wandering in the wilderness, and you've been complaining against God, and God sends serpents as punishment. And you're thinking about God's story. When you hear the word serpent, where do you go? Je I heard it, Genesis. Yeah, you go to Adam and Eve. The serpent is the trickiest of all beasts. It is the one that lies to Adam and Eve and tempts them. The serpent is the enemy. The serpent is the sign and symbol of sin, that separation from God. 
And so isn't it interesting that the punishment for complaining against God is sin? (laughs) The punishment itself is a sign of sin. And isn't it interesting that God tells Moses to craft a pole with a bronze serpent on it and to raise that serpent up, that symbol of sin. And by raising it up and touching it, the people are healed and made whole. Now, if you are a little puzzled, that's okay. Because in many ways, this story is not over. This story does not end until the crucifixion of Jesus. No, Jesus is not the serpent up on the cross. But Jesus does take in himself all of the sin. And by him being raised up, we are healed and made whole. He tries to explain this to Nicodemus, who is a learned man, a Pharisee, an expert in the law. And it's interesting because English translations argue over how to translate the word again. You see, in the text that we read this morning from the NIV, the New International Version that Gary read, it says, Jesus says several times, you cannot see the kingdom of God without being born again. You cannot enter the kingdom of God without being born again. The funny thing is that that's the misunderstanding that Nicodemus had. How can one be born again? (laughs) It only happens once in the body. There's another way to translate the word that is in the NIV translated as again. It is from above. So if we were to re-look at Jesus' text... What Jesus says, see the king, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. It's not just again, but it is from where we are born. And this is about orienting our lives to God. If we are born from above in spirit, we are changed. We are made anew so that we see with new eyes our brothers and sisters around us. So that when we look at each other, we see not broken, sinful people, but we see brothers and sisters created in the image of God. And all of us doing our best to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So that when we are born from above, we have new hands and new feet. And these new hands and feet are motivated to do the work of God, serving each other. Whether it's baking cookies for a family who is grieving or whether it's praying for a friend who's struggling. If we are born from above, we are given a new mouth, 
A mouth that speaks not words of hatred or anger, but a mouth that speaks words of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have life eternal. I have to admit that maybe it's the preacher in me, but it wasn't just hours after our oldest son, Joel, was born that uh, John 3.16 came into my mind. And it was at that moment that I'm holding this precious new life, my son. It was at that moment that I realized the true scandal of John 3.16. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not giving up my son for nobody. In fact, I would give up my own life for him. And God gave his son for you. A friend of mine who struggled with alcoholism for a long time, she had nearly, well, if she was telling the story, she would tell you she had destroyed her life multiple times over and over and over again. Until it was one day that God stepped in and changed her. And it was through a coworker. A coworker was visiting with her one day about this particular verse. And she said, do you realize that included in the world is you? And when we say, for God so loved the world, we are also saying, for God so loved Seth. For God so loved Wally, or Norm, or Marilyn, or Larry or Patty, for God so loved you that he gave his only son. And if you were the only person on earth, he still would have done it. Friends, it is by his wounds that we are healed as he is lifted up on the cross, Good Friday becomes good because of resurrection morning. It is by following in his footsteps and going to the cross that we are born anew that we are given new eyes to see, new hands to work, new mouths to speak, and new hearts to love. And for this, we give God thanks and praise. Amen. Please stand as you were able for our affirmation of faith, which comes from John chapter 3, as is printed in the bulletin. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, 
but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Amen. Please be seated. Dear friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will gather from north and south, east and west, and sit at God's table in the kingdom of heaven. And this meal that we share together is a foretaste of that heavenly meal where God will quench our thirst and fill our hunger eternally. As we prepare to share in this bread and in this cup, let us first come to God in thanksgiving and in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. O God, our Creator and Redeemer, in your wisdom you have made all things and you sustain them by your power. You formed us in your image to love and serve you. When we were slaves in Egypt, you freed us and led us through the waters of the sea. You fed us with heavenly food in the wilderness and satisfied our thirst from desert springs. On a holy mountain, you gave us your law to guide us in your way. Through the waters of the Jordan, you led us into the land of your promise, and you sustained us in times of trial. You spoke through the prophets, calling us to turn from our willful ways to a new obedience and righteousness. (coughs) You sent your Son to be the way to eternal life, Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices, our hearts together. You, O God, are holy, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He took upon himself the weight of our sin and carried the burden of our guilt. He shared our life in every way, and though tempted, was sinless to the end. Baptized as your own, he went willingly to his death and by your power was raised to new life. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, We take this bread and this cup from the gifts that you have given and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy sacrifice, that our lives may be, may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ, and by your Spirit unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. 
and help us, O God, to be obedient to your call to love all your children, to do justice, to show mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Guide us through the life of the wilderness. Quench our thirst with living waters. Satisfy our hunger with bread from heaven. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of your resurrection when with the redeemed of all the ages we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in your church, now and forevermore. Amen. Dear friends, go forth this morning showing the world just how much God loves, that he would give his Son for all. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit abide with all of us today, tomorrow, and always. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.